Thank you for making time today, Dr. Shinkevich, for this uh, brief interview about the propers. And we will get right into the propers, and I'll basically say my little piece, and then you can tell me if it makes any sense. But before we do that, um, I just wanted to ask just briefly about you're teaching at a Catholic college, correct? Right, Benedictine College out here in Atchison, Kansas. And is that the college, one of the colleges that all the teachers have to have the mandatum? Yes. Yes, we have the mandatum. Um, yeah, we're in the Newman Guide. Um, it's 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 gone through a big conversion this college, and it's it's a great place to be right now. Excellent. So it sounds like you're very much involved with the quote unquote you know normal parish life, normal Catholic life. You you deal with Catholic students. You understand their problems. Um, in 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 that in that sense, it doesn't sound like you're I guess what some people call an ivory tower professor. Is that correct? <laughs> No, not at all. And in fact, I'm I'm in a normal parish myself, so it's got its uh, its own uh, glories and its own faults as well. So excellent. Well, I can I can launch into the subject now. Um, I just wanted to let you know that the people that I'm interviewing for this series about the propers, I try to find people that are like we just discussed in kind of a normal setting. You know, normal Catholic life, normal parishes, normal uh, families, etc. So mm-hmm. again, thank you so much for for being willing to take part in this. So let me just state briefly uh, my premise, and then you can see if it makes any sense, and perhaps you can uh, help me make it clear. In other words, the reason we're doing these interviews is because this concept of the proper somehow gets lost in translation, and so few Catholics uh, understand anything about the propers, care about the propers, know about the propers. And so I figured if I just start doing interviews and I talk to normal, everyday Catholics, um, that that would be better than me saying the same thing a billion times. Right. So, so basically, what we have with the propers is to, to to use an analogy. You know, just like every mass has first reading, second reading, gospel, it doesn't occur to us to replace, for example, the second reading instead of reading sacred scripture that we would read a reflection, for example, by someone who's not Catholic, or a poem by someone who's not Catholic. That doesn't occur to us. And yet, with the propers, that's exactly what's happening in most parishes. They're replacing all the scripture, all the uh, propers, which, you know, propers are normally just a sentence or two from scripture. They're replacing Mm -hmm. those a lot of times with um, poems or reflections by non-Catholics. And I don't know who the big names are. I guess Marty Haugen, I've heard his name pronounced differently, but I I usually just say Haugen, um, is not a Catholic. Richard Prue was never a Catholic, and uh-huh. people are surprised to learn this because those are some of just examples of some of the really big names in Catholic publishing. And like I say, it's, it doesn't make any sense to us. And some people also might say, well, wait a second, you know, the, the propers aren't as long as the gospel, for instance. The gospel is usually pretty long. The propers are just a sentence or two from sacred scripture. So therefore, it doesn't really matter that we're replacing it, um, you know, because it's so short. But that's, that's wrong for two reasons. Number one, the propers are ancient. They go back 1,700 years, as far as mm-hmm. we can tell. But also, you know, they teach you in poetry class, the word at the first, the very first word in the line, and the very last word in the line, or the very opening sentence to a book and the very closing sentence or paragraph to a book, are actually pretty important. So, for instance, replacing the the, the introit, for example, the entrance chant, and doing that 100% of the time and always replacing it with a text by a non-Catholic, or even a Catholic, but not not the actual proper, I would submit to you that that, that, that does have an effect, because that's the first text of the Mass, and it sets the tone. Uh, actually, it's, it's, the interesting thing about it is that um, something similar to this began to happen right, uh, at the, right after the Second Vatican Council. Um, there were some people who decided that they were going to actually do what you said people would never do, which is replace readings or the Gospel or something like that. Um, they, uh, I've heard stories of, uh, I wasn't alive at the time, but I've, I've, I've heard accounts of people, for example, who replaced the gospel or the reading with things like the Little Prince, or wow. readings from novels and things like that. Now, that happened um, because, you know, during that tumultuous time, there was this sort of understanding that everything was up for grabs, falsely, of course, not, not according to, to the council itself. Mm-hmm. But... 
it was quickly it was quickly put down. It was quickly seen as something that is absolutely foreign to uh, any liturgy, any liturgical understanding of anything. Uh, mm-hmm. The history of liturgy, the tradition, um, all of that um, is it, it would go completely contrary to that. So the fact that that was that was put out so long ago um, makes it surprising. I think that that this. Uh, that the uh, the communion chant or the entrance chant would be something that, in and of itself, isn't even known at, or is or is very, very quickly disposed of um, for, as you were saying, anything almost. Mm-hmm. How many of your students would you guess know what a proper is? For example, know that the introit for Christmas, you know, is puer natus est, the child is born. How many per- percentage wise do you think know? I'd go to about zero. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually, at the beginning of my liturgy class, I, I ask them if they know what an introit is and what a gradual is, and mm-hmm. they have no idea what I'm talking about. And it's Is that something def- that you're able to work with them so that they, they learn about it? Well, we talk about what they are, and, and we specifically talk about... Um, you know, if I could do a whole class on sacred music, you know, we we would probably be able to get into it more. But um, I, I'm, what I'm trying to get across to them is this understanding of liturgy and organic change, and um, and tradition and liturgy, and how that all kind of goes together. Uh, because they don't have that understanding, they they I think what they think uh, is tradition in liturgy is what um, they've either always experienced, which is usually not tradition at all, or what they consider quote-unquote traditional, um, to the point that, you know, somebody will, I had another professor told me a story about a student came up to him and said, oh, I consider myself a traditional Catholic, you know, I, 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 only, I only like those hymns that are real traditional hymns, and he explained, well, if you were really a traditional Catholic, you wouldn't have hymns in your liturgy at all, <laughs> because yeah. hymns are pretty new Absolutely. for a liturgical thing. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, it was the chant and the propers that that went with the, the day Absolutely. that were it's it's that's the liturgical music of the day. So the the idea of even a hymn being traditional is I think foreign to Catholic understanding. I I agree, and and I think it's important to to point out here. Uh, see, I've written a lot about this. There's a, there's an article I wrote called uh, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Hymns. And it kind of goes into some of this stuff in terms of, for example, even pointing out that a hymn has two parts. In other words, it has a text and it has a melody. And, Mm -hmm. and, And we're not even to the point where anybody really even realizes those two things. So rather than rehashing all that, let me just say that I am in no way anti-hymn. Obviously, I produced a lot of hymnals, you know, and and that yeah. would be pretty stupid of me if I was if I was anti-hymn. But you're absolutely right. The the, the notion of the liturgy over 500, 1,000, 1,500, you know, 1,700 years, looking back at the way that quote unquote hymns fit in, you're absolutely right. Really does not have a strong place in that. And and what's even beyond that? I mean, leave that aside for a second. Um, what people talk about when they say hymns. They really, a lot of times, are really referencing songs, you know, and the and the songs right. can go the whole gamut of, you know, more traditional, less secular. I mean, there's all kinds of different songs, and they all always go into the whole spectrum of rock music, rap music, mariachi, or even right. like, like my parents. <laughs> well, my parents' age, you know, I mean, when when they were younger, they would go to funerals, and the priest would allow, you know, Beatles songs at at, at the funeral oh, mass, and so, so that's why I say, it's so easy to misquote. For example, you or, or me, and hear this and say, "Oh, he doesn't like hymns." Well, right. it's just it's just not that that simple to say something like that. And and like I say, first of all, for me, I want to make sure we even know what we're talking about. Are we talking about the text? Are we talking about the melody? Are we talking about a medieval melody? You know, because obviously, right. you know, in the in the office, there were beautiful medieval hymns and beautiful melodies. But that has nothing to do with the songs, and and the Broadway show tunes that are used in today's mass. So maybe that's why we shouldn't be surprised. Um, that there's so much ignorance about the propers in the sense of to even define one's terms, to even know what we're even talking about. You know, we're, what, 10 minutes into this interview and we haven't even really, <laughs> you know, exp- because it's not it's not the easiest concept. Does that, would you right. agree with that statement? Yeah, I think that's true. And, and, and I think another thing is, is that 
people who are are normally pretty liturgically savvy or or try to really instill beauty in liturgy according to the tradition even they have a misunderstanding of the propers they don't they don't really understand that there are propers number 1 or that they're meant to be sung lots of times they're kind of seen as sort of a private uh, prayer to be recited or to be thought about or or, mm-hmm. or a little nugget to think about whereas it, they're really a part of the liturgy itself, and that's I think that's been yeah. lost on a, on a couple of generations now. Well, and and again, there's a there's a whole bunch we could talk about. And then, by the way, I, before I forget, I, I hope that you know someday you would consider talking to me again for another interview. But I promise we'd keep this brief. So I think the last thing I want to ask is, how do you see any possible change that that we could go from a culture where such a what four percent, two percent, one percent of Catholics, or even less, know what the propers are. How can we change that? How can we fix this? Do you see it being fixed? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it could be. I think, I think the biggest thing uh, when it comes to sort of liturgical aberrations is catechesis. Uh, I think people just need to learn these things. Um, most of the time, they don't know what they've you know what the liturgy i mean some of these things have happened you know before they were born and um so they've always kind of grown up in a church that was like this or like that and mm-hmm. they just don't know what exactly the roman rite i mean if it, you know if we're talking about the roman rite here what the roman rite really looks like and what it traditionally has been and what mm-hmm. for centuries you know how it's built through centuries and how you know basically in the past 30 years we've We've lost a lot of what has been built up over the centuries mm-hmm. organically. So, you know, the way I explained it in my liturgy class is it's the, the Sacrosanctum Concilium refers to the liturgy as the song of the bride to the bridegroom. Mm-hmm. And so the church, in, in a sense, adorning herself in preparation for her wedding, which is going to be the consummation of the world at the end of time, she... she continually finds new things to make herself beautiful for the bride, the bridegroom, I'm sorry. And so when Christ comes, the liturgy is, I, I think, it, it, a very, it's a very eschatological thing. It's moving towards um, its own perfection through its organic change. Mm-hmm. So the problem comes about when we start forgetting things like the propers and and um, you know, thinking that what's 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 traditional is sort of Marty <laughs> Marty Hoggin tunes. Sure, um, yeah. But instead, I think what needs to happen is we need to have a, an education on liturgy, mm-hmm. um, because I think people have become really liturgically ignorant and just don't understand that it's that it is that we're entering into this mystery that has been passed down to us, rather than this sort of celebration of our community. And let me uh, let me just I don't want to repeat myself, but but. D- did I understand correctly that that you have been teaching your students about this subject? Is that is that correct? Yeah, I have. I, I, I try mm-hmm. to get them to at least become aware of the fact that the liturgy they experience now may not may not look a lot like the liturgy that has been passed down to us, and mm-hmm. that we should we should really study liturgy and understand it because it's it's not it's not ours to to make as we like it. It's ours to enter into. So taking it a step further then, I guess, do I correctly understand that what you're doing in your part of the world is to try to instill in your students a love of the propers, and hopefully they can take that with them wherever they go as they grow up and as they go into the world and continue to be Catholics, and that you think will have a positive effect in terms of people starting to care about this subject. Is that, is that an accurate statement? Yeah, especially if they if they go out and they're actually active in their parish life uh, and and in the liturgical life of their parish, then they'll have you know hopefully they'll have this idea that you know this isn't just something we make. If it is something we create and make, then it's not really liturgy. Yeah. Instead, it's it's something that we that we inherit from from years past, and we have to be faithful to that heritage. Whether it's you know uh, with with other parts of liturgy or specifically like we're talking about today the propers and the mm-hmm. the fact that they're they've corresponded with the the feast days throughout the history of the Roman Rite. Absolutely. Well, my final comment will just be to say that um, it's so great to speak to someone like you, and and I appreciate it. And just to know 
because I because I, I'm not I have no interest in people who overstate things. I have no interest in people who demagogue and 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 don't tell the truth. But mm -hmm. but the fact is, when it comes to the propers, I mean, some of these shocking statements that I've made are absolutely true, and it, it baffles the mind. And, and one says, this this can't be. Is this I mean, is this really the the case? And it turns out it is. So spe that's why I say speaking to people like you to know that. There are people out there who are saying, yes, this is an issue, this is a problem, it needs to be addressed. Um, it really fills me with great hope, and I'm going to continue these interviews, and we'll continue to talk to people, and hopefully, um, again, begin a movement or, or continue a movement that's already started, um, and hopefully make a difference. So I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on. It really does um, really does inspire me to, to speak to someone like you. Sure. Well, thanks for inviting me. I, I, I'm glad to help.